So uh, today what we are going to do is not just talk about how to do updates in SQL, but also a bunch of stuff about transactions. I think the concept of a transaction was introduced on day one and we are going to go deeper into that today. So the first one third of today is stuff which will reflect in what you do in the lab and the other two thirds is probably not what you will do in the lab, you may do a little bit. But these are concepts which are very important. Uh, you will need to use them when you build actual systems. So that's an overview of today's um, three hours. Advanced queries, updates, views, which we covered yesterday, and then transactions. So the first uh, topic of today is uh, this business of join types. You saw natural join. You used it, and uh, we discussed what is natural join uh, using relations. And then in SQL, you just wrote, uh, let us say uh, account join depositor or account natural join depositor. What exactly happens and what if you need to do more than one join? That is one issue. The other is um, this issue of outer joins. Uh, somebody had asked a question that if you join uh, account and customer and a particular customer does not have an account, what happens to the customer record? It does not come out in the join. Okay. So now what if you want it to appear in the join? You want that to see the customer in the result, but with some value, which would be what? For the account information, what value would you store? Unknown. Unknown. Null. Null. Okay. So you want it to appear in the result, but with null for the account information. Okay. How do you do such types of joins? These are called outer joins. So um, here is a summary of the join types, and there is another issue of what are called join conditions uh, in SQL. So I uh, will come back to that slide to show the summary, but let us first of all see what are outer joins. So here is a relation loan and a relation borrower. Now look carefully at this and you will see that there is a loan number L260 for which there is no borrower information here and correspondingly there is a loan 155 for which there is no loan information here. Okay, this is probably an inconsistent state of the database. But if I want to join these two tables and get that partial uh, borrower information and the partial loan information, what do I do? So there are um, several types of auto joins. Let us start with the simplest one. The, uh, before we get into auto join, the normal join is also called inner join. And you can uh, use the syntax we saw before, select uh, star from loan comma borrower where loan dot loan number equal to borrower dot loan number. That would give this table here. So what happened? Uh, L160, which did not have a matching borrower vanished. And then that borrower Hayes, whose loan number was missing here, these two rows have vanished from the result. So only the other tuples are present. Okay, So that is a normal join. And this shows another syntax in SQL for the same join operation. So you can say loan inner join borrower on and uh, you give a condition. So the where clause condition can appear after an on and you can stick this whole thing in the from clause. So you can say select star from loan inner join borrower on loan dot loan number equal to borrower dot loan number. This is just syntax. Okay, so far, so good. Now what we want, let us say, is we want to find loan information even if there is no matching borrower. Okay. So I want to find out what are such loans and what is the amount in the branch. The only thing which will be missing is the um, customer name. So how do I do this? And the way to do it is as follows. I will say loan left outer join borrower. And now I have to give this condition here on loan dot loan number equal to borrower dot loan number. Note that the condition for an outer join like this cannot be in the where clause. I'll come back to why that is the case. But for an outer join like this, the condition has to be right here. You have to say relation left outer join another relation on condition. So the condition has to be there. So now what has happened? When I say loan left outer join, this left part of outer join says that the left input which happens to be loan here is preserved. No tuple from it is lost in the join. 
if it match if a tuple in loan matches something in borrower it appears as in the normal join if it matches two uh, things in the borrower relation it will appear twice however if it matches no tuple in the right input by matching what do i mean matching on this condition the on condition here if it does not match anything there then you are going to output it in the result but to the columns from the right input that is borrower here set to null so note that loan number actually appears twice here this one is from where loan dot loan number this one is borrower dot loan number and here borrower dot loan number and borrower dot customer name are both null okay so this is very useful in many situations where you want to get complete information about customers whether or not they have policies these two tables the hmm. foreign key is not there just uh, two primary keys are there in two tables and we are joining on that particular field um in this case uh, if you had a foreign key from borrower to loan uh, the, the one of these situations that is the uh, where is it data here yeah this one where there is a haze with loan number l155 which doesn't exist that cannot occur okay but we have not defined a foreign key in the key. other way we have not insisted in our database that a loan must have a borrower a loan can exist without any borrower hmm. which is probably an error also so you could have a different kind of integrity constraint which says that if there is a loan here there must be at least one tuple in the borrower relation this is not a foreign key dependency but it's very similar to foreign key dependency it's called an inclusion dependency uh, unfortunately there is no standard syntax in sql for it there is a way to specify it uh, using a check clause we we uh, briefly saw a check clause so you can add in the check clause that this value is present in the other table um and uh, then you just hope that the database does it efficiently there are many databases which don't handle check clauses very cleverly um so uh, the point is that foreign key is one type of integrity constraints but there are others which are not directly modeled in sql which may be required to prevent this sort of thing happening however in this case uh, if it does happen then you do auto joins to retrieve partial information there may be reasons uh, you know in a bank with loans this is probably not going to happen it's it's a bad situation but there are other situations where you may have partial information um so maybe um when you have customers you have an extra table which is um some external information about the customer let's say uh, some information from the income tax department about that customer so that may be present for some of your customers but you don't have it for all the customers so now if you do a left out a join of your customer with that income tax information from an external source it makes sense you cannot assume there is a foreign key so there may be information missing then you do an auto join but here we are using a simple example just to keep continue using the uh, schema which you are familiar with now so that one was left out a join as you can imagine um no. there are other variants of it so now here are another variant of the um, auto join but this time we are using a natural join so what is the difference between uh, let's take this top table first let's start with natural inner join which is the same as the natural join the inner is implicit so in your queries yesterday you wrote some queries which said account natural join customer that is completely equivalent to saying uh, in a natural inner join and this is the same result which was there on the previous slide almost what is the difference look at this result and look at this result in fact the result is the same but when you do a natural inner join uh, duplicate columns should not appear I, i don't know how this got in here it should look like that the natural join removes duplicate columns similarly on this one if you notice uh this time it is a natural right out a join so first let's look at the right out a join part in the right out a join the right input is preserved the left input may not be preserved so here what we are guaranteeing is that every borrower tuple is going to appear in the result so we had a borrower had what a loan number and a customer name so what were the tuples uh, that were there in borrower l170 jones l230 smith 
L155 Hayes. So all those are present. However, the attributes from loan might be null if there is no matching loan. So in this case, uh, L155 did not have a matching loan. So branch name and amount are null. Note one other difference from the previous one. Uh, this was left out a join, but in terms of the attributes in the result, what is the difference? This was just a plain left out a join on. This guy is a natural right out a join. What is the difference in the uh, loan number appears only once. So once you say natural, repeated columns are equated. So if the same column name appears in the left and right input, implicitly the condition is that they are equal. And once they are equal, there is no point outputting them twice. And so the definition of natural joins is replace them by one copy. That's it. Yeah. Sir, I want to know what will happen if the attributes are different in the tables and only the key is same. Like uh, you got my point. Customer name is there in the right table, but it is not there. The attribute is not available in the left and the same vice versa. Like what if, will happen? In if there is no common attribute at all between the two tables, what happens? Only the key is the common thing. Other things are totally different. Other attributes. It doesn't matter whether the common attribute is a key or not. In any case, you will do a join equating them. Yeah. Now, if the common attribute is a key, that means one tuple from here can match at most one tuple from there. That's all. Because if it's a key on both relations, that's simply a special case. There's nothing really different about it. It's, it's just the same as this. Uh, so it doesn't matter whether the attribute is a key or not. Uh, this query illustrates actually two different things. First, let me uh, describe the auto join part of it. This query says loan full auto join borrower using loan number. Okay, so first of all, uh, full auto join means that tuples from both the relations are preserved using lists a set of columns uh, which should be equated, not preserved, beg your pardon, using lists a set of columns which should be equated. So in this case, we are saying equate only loan number. You don't have to equate, uh, even if there is another column which is the same age between these two tables, they are not equated. So that will avoid the kind of problem which you are talking about, where you have some extraneous attribute which just happened to have the same name and it ends up causing a mismatch. So here, uh, with the using, uh, you ensure that only loan number is taken into account and then you get this result. In the other table, if a uh, loan number is not there, that particular entry is not appearing, those will not come uh, here. That would be an error. It will say that uh, you are using um, this attribute, loan number, in the using clause, but it is there in only one of the relations. Uh -huh. okay. So that is an error. The uh, SQL compiler will catch it at that point. So now, from this table, you can uh, do something like, uh, if you want to find those who have an account or a loan, but not both, what would you do? So in this table, what do you have? For those who have both, you have uh, tuples which have both a loan number and account number. Right. And for others, you'll have null for account number or null for loan number. From this result, if I want to extract those who have only one of an account or a loan, but not both, I can add a where clause condition, which is what one of them should be null. Okay, so you can say uh, in the where clause um, that loan number is null or account number is null. You can't say equals null; you have to say is null. And notice that that condition is in the where clause, not in the on clause or the using clause. That has to come later. So now let me come back to the question of. Why should these conditions be in the on or using as opposed to in the where clause? And the reason is as follows. Uh, when you have a um, regular join, you have a set of relations and then a set of conditions in the where clause. And the semantics is you take a cross product first, then apply the conditions. For auto join, that is not quite right. That is not how auto joins work. You have to take for each tuple, see if there is a matching tuple in the other one. But matching on what condition, that is the issue. And that condition is specified in the and on clause. And that is why you have to provide it right there. And auto join is defined for two relations only. You can't, it does not make sense to say auto join of three relations. Whereas you can say cross product of three relations is well defined. But an auto join will preserve the left input or the right input or both. Now what is a three way auto join? It's not defined. You can do an auto join with three relations if you do it in two steps. 
if you have relations A, B and C, you can take first of all A outer join, say left outer join B and then on that you can do outer join C or you can do maybe um, B outer join C and then outer join A, but the results are not the same. Even if you keep the same order, uh, you can uh, say A outer join B outer join C. Let me write it here. Can I get this input? Okay. So, this symbol over here is the outer left outer join symbol. So, let us say A, B and C are relations. A left outer join B, left outer join C. Okay. So, that is one possible query. Now, another possible query is A left outer join B left outer join C. It turns out these two are not the same. The results are not the same. Uh, I would not go into why this is the case, but just believe me that the results are not the same and it should be even more clear that the results of that are quite different from B left outer join A left outer join. Here it is very clear that the results are different because here the tuples in B are preserved whereas here the tuples in A are preserved. And if you compare um, these two, um, it turns out that uh, tuples of B um, are not preserved here uh, and over here a uh, tuple of C which joins with A will be preserved uh, even if it does not join with B whereas here a tuple of C which joins with a may in fact vanish from here. So, let us uh, I am trying to give you some intuition for why this and this are not the same. Okay? So, for outer joins you have to do two at a time and that is why the uh, syntax uh, used is slightly different. So, here is a actual query which uses an outer join in the from clause. Outer joins always appear in the from clause. So, what has happened here? We have done depositor natural full outer join borrower and that is in the from clause and then from that we can select whatever attributes we want. Uh, so, here we have selected customer name and here we did the query which I talked about a few minutes back where this is null or that is null. Okay? So, this whole syntax is restricted to appear in the from clause and you should put brackets around it so that it is unambiguous. So, after this you can do one more, you can say natural full outer join, but it should be properly bracketed so that it is clear that you first do outer join depositor borrower and then do the outer join with customer. Any questions? The syntax for full outer join, mm -hmm. if we uh, omit the word natural, mm -hmm. so that is still valid? Mm, not really. Uh, you have to use one of natural, on or using. If you say on, the condition is explicitly specified. Okay. If you say using, it is on the specified columns. If you say natural, it is on all. So, so coming uh, back here, you can see that the join condition is either natural, on or using and the join type is either inner join, left outer join, right outer join or full outer join. So, any combination of this is allowed. You can say natural inner join, natural left outer join and so forth or inner join on predicate, inner join using, uh, right outer join on right outer join using. Now, this is another kind of query which is a top k query. If I want to find the top few results in some order without looking at all the results in PostgreSQL as well as in uh, Oracle and SQL Server, I can do this. Although the SQL standard does not allow this, most databases support this syntax. So, here I am saying select star from R s where R s dot s equal to uh, I mean R dot b equal to s dot b that is anything it is just a regular query. I have an order by clause and then I say limit 10. So, what will this give me? It will give me the top top 10 or bottom 10 ascending, ascending therefore bottom 10 it will give me the, the ascending to the lowest one it will give me the bottom 10. If you want the top 10 you say descending. If you say nothing if you do not give an order by clause, what will happen? No, no, if you do not give an order by clause, if you it can be anything, correct. So, if you do not give an order by clause, if you just add a limit, it can be anything. 
So sometimes you just want to look at a relation, but you don't want to see the entire set of rows. Uh, you can do this. So let's run this here. Let's take the same query and add a limit two. You see, just two rows up here. So if I believe that the answer is very big, I don't want to see all the answer, but I want to see a few rows from the answer. I can add that limit. If I want to find the top few rows, I'll add the order by. Um, so in this case, uh, let's say I want to order by name. So I get Amitabh and Charles. If I had increased the limit, I would get more names. Now we'll move on to the next part of uh, today's uh, presentation, which is on modifying the database. And how do you do modifications using SQL? Again, for any modification, you have to specify a condition and then you specify the update or delete, insert, whatever has to be done. Or you can provide values to be inserted. There is a completely different way of doing modifications which you can do from a programming language. You can have a query, open a cursor on that query for update, and then step through that cursor. And then for each record, you can decide whether to update that record or not. This mode corresponds to what you might have done in COBOL. You must be doing it all the time. right? So you take a file, you step through it to the record that you need, either with an index or sequentially, and then update that record in the file. So SQL, uh, when it's embedded in COBOL or other languages, allows you that mode of operation. And people do use it. It is quite useful to do things that way. I'm not saying that's a wrong way of doing things. But if you want to do it directly in SQL, then this is how you do it. And this is what is done more often now. Um, people are more comfortable with this. So here are um, several uh, things which you can do, which start with deletion. So this is delete all account tuples are the Perry Ridge branch. So delete from account where branch name equal to Perry Ridge. All the account tuples vanish. Um, now, what will happen to depositor tuples when this happens? If the account vanishes, what will happen to the depositor tuple? Uh, if there is, uh, cascade is there, uh, constraint is there. The foreign key constraint. Yeah. So if there is a foreign key constraint, this will not be allowed. However, if you specify the foreign key constraint, you can actually add a clause to the foreign key constraint, uh, which says that um, depositor um, account number foreign key references account. You can add a clause in there which says on delete cascade. In that case, what will happen is when you delete the account, the depositor tuple will also get deleted. It's called a cascading delete. Okay, I've not covered it in the uh, talk here, but you can look it up uh, from any manual. Yeah. Yes, which we discussed now. If customer table is the primary one, having the customer ID as primary key, or account number as the primary key, which one, if you delete, it will cascade? Whether uh, If you delete a delete. record, whatever uh, record you delete, if somebody references it, they will get deleted. They will get deleted. But if you reference something, that will not, that be, deleted. That will not be deleted. So in this case, um, let's say that I have a depositor record. The depositor record references um, customer. account. Account. And customer, both. OK? So if you delete the depositor record, the account is not going to get deleted. The customer is not going to get deleted. Only Even if you have specified on delete cascade. Okay. Because the direction of the primary key is from, let's say, the, this is the reference relation, this is the referencing relation, so it's pointing this way. If you delete this fellow, it doesn't affect this guy. Right. If you delete this guy, it affects this guy. So one of two things happens. If you have a foreign key, if you delete this guy, the system says, sorry, somebody is referencing you, you, you are not allowed to go away. But if you have specified on delete cascade, then the system will delete the referencing guy also. See. But in this case, we have not specified on delete cascade. So what do we do? What if I do want to delete accounts from the Perry Ridge branch. If I just run this, it's not going to succeed. So what do I do?
how how can i delete accounts at peri ridge branch given that i have a foreign key constraint without an on delete cascade yeah i have to first remove it from the depositor that's exactly the solution so first i will run a query which finds uh, the depositors which should be deleted delete them and then come back and uh, delete from account so uh, here is another query which says delete all accounts at every branch located in the city need help. So what this shows is um, the where clause condition here can be local to this or it can be a subquery. So in this case delete from account where branch name in select branch name from branch where branch city equal to need help. So you can have nested subqueries. You can't do a join here of course because delete from a single relation but the where clause can have nested queries. This is quite useful. Here is another query. Delete the <coughs> records of all accounts with balance below the average at that bank. Okay. Now, we are, this is obviously a silly query you, uh, update. You wouldn't actually want to do this, but it just shows you what you can do. How do you do this? So, let's say we write this query. Delete from account where balance less than select average balance from account. Well, something funny could happen depending on how it is executed. Okay. So, let's say uh, we start with one tuple with the first tuple in the relation, we find the average balance. See if the amount is less than the average balance, we delete it. Now we come to the second tuple. If I compute the average balance again, it's going to change. Now I have a problem. Depending on the order in which I delete tuples, a different set of tuples can be deleted. If I uh, first chose A, then the average may change by some amount, then B may not get deleted. But if I chose B first, then the average may uh, change in such a way that A still gets deleted. So depending on which I delete first, the final result can change. That's very bad, right? So what is the solution? SQL will not recompute this subquery every, every time. It computes it once, in effect, and use it. In, in fact, the way to look at it is, it doesn't actually do any deletion. It first finds out which all tuples should be deleted. It runs this subquery. It doesn't delete itself. It just marks it for deletion. And then after it finds out what all tuples have to be deleted, then it goes once and deletes all of them without recomputing this condition. So as I just told you, um, first compute this part, compute the where class condition, find out which all tuples to be deleted, and then delete all the tuples without doing any further testing. So the opposite of deletion is insertion. And for insert, you just do the following. Insert into account values, and then you can give the values that you want. Uh, you can also write it like this, insert into account, and then list the attributes which you are going to provide, and then provide values for those attributes. What if you omit an attribute from here? What value will it take? It will be null, unless you have said not null or it is a primary key. In which case, uh, this insert will fail, saying you are trying to store null in a value which cannot be null. In fact, SQL also has a, uh, when you declare an attribute, you can even give a default value for it. Maybe the default should be 0. When you create a new account, maybe the value should be 0 by default. So if you don't specify the balance, it will be 0 by default, if you have specified that default in the table declaration. If you want to explicitly set balance to null, you can do that also. Insert into account values, and here you give null. Note that there are no quotes. Strings are enclosed in quotes. Integers and uh, numbers in general are not in quotes. They are just typed as numbers. Null is not in quotes. It's a special uh, name, which is not in quotes. So now here is another query, which does the following. This illustrates that you can insert not just one value at a time. You can insert a large number of tuples at a time by running a query and inserting the result of that query into another relation. So this is illustrated here. Um, first look at the query and then we will see what it means. Insert into account and now here is a select query. Select something from something where something. Okay, so this is a general form of an insert which can insert multiple things as from a query result. Uh, you can also have a variant of this values which lists one after another many different values. Those have to be explicitly listed. Whereas here, you use a query to create something. 
So in this case, um, for whatever reason, we have decided to provide as a gift for all loan customers of Perry Ridge Branch a $200 savings account. Now, if you make an account, you have to give it an account number. This is a problem. Uh, so the solution used here is a shady cheating solution, just to keep the query simple. In reality, you would have a procedure which creates accounts. It will have a sequence number for accounts and create a new uh, account number on the fly. Okay? Uh, but here, to keep it simple, we have just assumed that let the loan number serve as the account number, just to illustrate the query. Yes. So uh, the loan number and account number are both in our uh, schema, which we have used access. They're both varchar 10. Okay, so that is fine. So now, you say insert into account loan number, branch name 200 from loan, where branch name is Perry Ridge. This matches the first attribute of account, which happens to be account number. This matches the branch name attribute, which is the second attribute. And this corresponds to the third attribute, which is the balance. So that adds into account. And now we also need a corresponding thing in the depositor. So customer name, loan number, this, this is the same thing. Uh, in this case, the loan number becomes the account number, which we have also used here. Um, except here, we had to do one more step because to get the customer name, we had to join with loan number. So if you, uh, this query actually does a join, whereas this one did not need to do a join. All the attributes were available in loan itself. And again, the select uh, clause here is evaluated fully before anything is inserted into the relation. Why does that matter? Because you are allowed to do something like this. Insert into table one, select star from table one. What does this do? If you uh, kept running the select on the fly, and then <laughs> insert a tuple, it appears in there, gets inserted again, you'll get into an infinite loop. So here again, you compute this query completely, get the result, and only after that you start the insertion process. Now here is another thing which says increase all accounts with balances over dollar ten thousand by six percent and all others by five percent. So now, uh, how would you do this? Well, you could write two update statements. Um, so if the value is greater than ten thousand, set balance star one point zero six. So this is the syntax of an update statement. Update table name, set, and then you can have any number of these column name equal to expression. You can have multiple of these. You can update multiple columns. And then where some condition. So in this case, uh, we just updated the balance to this. And the condition was balance greater than 10,000. Now, this fellow does what? For those which are less than uh, or equal to 10,000, you set balance to 1.05 times this. Now, this is a very tricky query. This query works. But supposing you flipped these two, what will happen? So the, the balance was just under 10,000. So first you give 5%, <laughs> then you give 6%. So the customer may be happy, the bank is very unhappy. Okay. So when you do an update like this, you should not do it really using two statements. It's dangerous. There is a way to do it, uh, which is shown here. There is a conditional update, right? So you can express that by using a case statement. Update account set balance equal to, and then the case statement when some condition, then something else, something else. Okay, so this value is returned by the case statement, depending on whether balance is less than ten thousand. One of these two is done. So this is the right way of doing that. It's it's not a good idea to write two updates. Do it in one. Now in these examples, the value to be updated is available locally in the tuple. So I'm taking the value from this tuple and multiplying it by a fixed value. What if the update has to be done taking into account a value from some other tuple, in maybe in some other relation? What would you do? Take this. I'm updating the value using the old value and multiplying it by a fixed amount. Just take this query. Supposing instead, um, I have another table which says uh, for each account, 
how much interest to give. And I want to update account by using information from that other table. What do I do? No. Yeah, what you will have to do is over here, instead of saying balance times 1.06, I'll have a nested subquery there, which returns a single value. And that nested subquery can uh, use, um, at, uh, you know, you have to match it, of course. So you have to look for the corresponding account number in that other table. So that nested subquery can use the account number from this account. Okay, so that is a common mode where you have a nested sub. We, all, we saw nested subqueries in the where clause, but uh, nested subquery in the set clause is also supported. In this um, example, we have only two things. One is uh, over ten thousand dollars to six percent, and then five percent. Yeah. If you have more than two, you six can six percent, five percent, three percent. Here, use the case statement, and have multiple where when something something. And this is the else case where none of the other conditions is true. Then this is the last one. So I use a case statement. Uh, the case statement is available with only update or with insert select also. We it's can available use. with anything. With it's anything. a general uh, construct in SQL. Again, you may find some databases don't support it, but it is reasonably widely supported. Because it seems to be powerful. Means it can make life easy. Yeah, absolutely. Can we, what all can we do with a view? We saw that we can use a view in a query. The next question is, can you update a view? Can you insert something into a view? Can you delete from a view? Can you update a view? And it turns out this is a very tricky question. Um, so take this view. Uh, it's actually a very simple view. It just takes loan and projects out only loan number and branch name. So what is not shown? What is not there in the select clause here? The, for the amount, for loan is amount. Okay, so loan amount is not available. So this is a view you might make available to somebody. Uh, how do you make views available? We'll see later, there's a grant thing. But now, if you try to do the following, insert into branch loan values L37 Perry Ridge, what will the system do? The view is not an actual relation, so it cannot actually put a tuple in that relation. So the best thing it can do is go and update the underlying relation, which is loan, in a way such that this will appear in the view branch loan. And I can do that actually in this case by inserting L37 Perry Ridge null into the loan relation, provided of course that the loan relation allows the amount to be null, which in a real bank will not be the case. It don't want loan to be null. But if you allowed it, then a database might allow you to do this. Okay, so this is a relatively easy case. Here's another one, which uh, says create view V, a select loan number branch name amount from loan, where branch name equal to Perry Rich. Okay, so what is this view doing? It's giving me a subset of the rows of that table. If I insert into this view, um, this particular tuple, L99 downtown 23, okay, but before we get into downtown, supposing I insert L99 Perry Ridge 23, can that be implemented? The, this update of the view, how will it be implemented? It's not difficult. Go insert that into the loan and that will appear in the result. But Instead of Perry Ridge, I have put downtown here. Now there's a problem. If I insert the loan, Still I will not it will not appear in the view because the view only contains Perry Ridge. So it's not actually possible to insert this into the view. Okay. So the database will actually reject this. It will say you cannot do this. Okay. The simpler solution might have been to say that you are not allowed to update any view at all. No updates allowed then life is easy. But then there are some situations where people need to be able to update the view. Um, so for example, if you give this view to this branch, and you want to allow the branch to insert tuples into their view. But insert their own tuples. They should not be inserting tuples for some other branch. And therefore, databases do support uh, these kinds of things, uh, which will work as long as the 
condition here is matched. If it's not, it will be rejected. Sir, uh, I am still not able to understand why do we need to uh, update a view, insert a value into the… So, the simplest solution is say no updates on views, forget it. But there are situations, like I said, where you may want to allow a bank… But it will branch. not show the true picture of the relations which we are using… That is right. Uh, to it, it, this, this particular view is allowing you to see only records at your branch, which may be reasonable, right? So, if you have a bank which does not want a branch to go and see all sorts of other records or it, if it is not a bank, maybe it is a, a company where you allow a particular office to see only sales from their office, not from other offices. That may be secret. You do not want them to know about it. So, then you might give a view like this and still allow them to update it. So, that was this was one case where you could still do certain updates, but others are rejected. Now, there is other cases where you cannot do anything. So, this view all customers, uh, let us go back up and see this. All customers view does the following. Um, it is a view consisting of branch and their customers. That customer might have a loan or an account or both, we do not know. So, what the view does is it takes all the depositor account pairs and selects branch name, customer name. Similarly, uh, borrow a loan pair and selects branch name, customer name. So, the result of the view has branch name, customer name, but you do not know whether that particular customer had an account, a loan or both. And now, if you try to insert into all customer values Perry Ridge John, this database has no clue what to do. Should it insert an account? Should it insert a loan? In either case, it would have to insert a null value. So, this update cannot be handled at all. So, database systems, if they see a view containing union, will simply reject it. In fact, uh, unfortunately, some database systems do not even support views with unions, forget updating them. Uh, but even if they did support view with union, they will not allow it. Similarly, a view with a join, most database systems will not allow you to update them. Although there are some special conditions under which it is still possible, many database systems will not allow you joins in the view. Only select views are supported typically. And aggregates also mess up the whole thing. So, no aggregates, typically no joins, although some do support joins. Okay, so that was uh, updates and views. So, with this, we are going to move to a different uh, phase of this talk where we are not going to look at queries anymore for the rest of today. Rather, we are going to look at a whole bunch of concepts related to transactions. Means uh, using cursor for selection or update, like we are doing it also from the COBOL side. But what I have observed is that resources taken is so huge. Uh, so during your lecture, can you throw light on that? Like uh, it takes a hell lot of time to open a cursor, then select it, and then update it. Means uh, uh, means what I felt was that uh, for practical point of view, it will not be feasible. Like no, I think the. Yeah problem which you had may be related to the question he had. If you have open a cursor with a where clause condition and there is no index available, then it will take a long time. It is going to search through the whole relation to find matching rows. So, that is probably the reason for your problem. Uh, we can discuss it in more detail afterwards. Okay. So, before the tea break, let me uh, just introduce you to this notion of transactions. Uh, you probably saw a little bit of this earlier, acid properties, but let us go over it again in any case. Um, so, what is a transaction? It is basically a unit of program execution that may access and update various things in the database. So, a small example of a transaction transfers $50 from account A to account B. So, here it reads A modifies A, writes it back and this guy reads B, modifies it and writes it. It is the same transaction which does both. So, obviously, this is a simple transaction. You guys in LIC will have a lot of transactions going on. When you uh, issue a policy, uh, you have to create a policy record, you have to create a record for the payment which is received, you may have to create a record for something which tracks when to send reminders to this person, 
So there may be many relations which are updated when a policy is created. All of these together is conceptually one transaction because when you interact with the customer, all of those steps should happen. It should not be that you take money from the customer and don't give the policy or give the policy and don't take the money or taking the money is a physical act. From the viewpoint of the database, correspondingly you update something in the database saying money received. So you cannot issue a policy without putting money received. You cannot um, uh, you know, put money received without issuing the policy. They are a unit, they are a transaction. So as long as the system is running properly, no crashes and so on, uh, generally there is no major issue here. However, there are two major issues to deal with when you have transaction processing. The first is failures of various kinds. Power may go off in the middle of a transaction. Your computer system may have a problem in the middle of a transaction. It may die for some reason. What to do in the presence of such failures? The second kind of problem is because multiple transactions may execute concurrently. Why should they even execute concurrently? I will describe that a bit later. So coming back to this simple transaction, what are some of the requirements of this transaction? The first step is atomicity, which I just described. So what you want is that either all the updates of this transaction are done or it should appear that none of those was done. That is atomic, atomic in the sense not divisible in the old meaning of atomic. Of course, we know atoms are divisible, but here the old meaning of atom was uh, something which cannot be divided. So a transaction should not logically be divided. Physically, when it runs, of course, it has to first execute one update and then the other. You can't prevent that. But what should happen is that if a transaction has partially executed, then its updates are not reflected in the database or equivalently they are removed from the database. So that after cleaning up, it appears as if the transaction never ran. So you cannot help a failure in the middle, but if a failure happens in the middle, you should undo whatever was done to restore the state. That is the idea of atomicity. Okay. So if you don't do that, money will either be lost or generated here. Okay, so that is atomicity. The next requirement is durability. Once this transfer has taken place, the customer has been told your money is transferred if the database somehow loses this update. Let's say that both of these updates were done in memory and now power fails. So the disk is not updated. When power comes back on, you have forgotten all about the transaction. Now the customer is going to be very unhappy if this happens. They may, uh, B may issue a check which bounces and land up in jail. Okay? So you can't afford that. So it has to be durable. So the updates must persist even if there are software or hardware failures. And then um, there are one more requirement which is consistency, which is actually a slightly different requirement. Uh, this is not the job of the system, although it comes under the ACID property set. This is usually something which is the job of the programmer rather than the system. So in this case, when you transfer money from an account to another, the total amount of money should not change. You can't, the bank cannot you know, just generate money from out of the blue. Money has to come from somewhere. You can move money between accounts, but it cannot just appear from, or you can accept money from outside or give money outside, but it cannot suddenly pop up in the middle. Okay? So that is a consistency requirement. And your transaction code must maintain the consistency requirements. Each domain has a different set of consistency requirements, and the code should make sure that they are satisfied. Uh, so there are many kinds of consistency requirements. Some are primary key or foreign key. These are explicitly specified to the database, and the database ensures that they are satisfied. If your transaction violates that, the transaction is aborted. We'll see what that means. However, many others are implicit. 
um, for example, the banks, let's say this is a very simple bank, all it does is get in cash as deposit and then hand out cash as loan, that's all. Then um, the sum of balances of all accounts minus sum of the loans which have been handed out must be equal to the cash in hand. This is a real life constraint which must be respected by the data in the database. Cash in hand is also a variable in the database which reflects physically the cash in hand and these must be consistent. How do you ensure this? Again your transaction code has the responsibility for ensuring this. You cannot specify an integrity constraint in the database which enforces it but your code must take care. Okay. So we will assume that that is the case and what happens is that if a transaction when it starts must see a consistent database. While the transaction is executing the database may be inconsistent. <coughs> After this step money has vanished from A. It's not yet gone into B. So money has temporarily vanished. The database is temporarily inconsistent. But after the next uh, step, and I mean, by th at the end of the transaction, the database must again be consistent. So this is the guarantee that a transaction gives, the transaction code. If the database was consistent when it started, when it finishes successfully, the database will be consistent again. If it doesn't finish successfully, what should happen? Everything that it does should be undone. That is atomicity. But consistency is when it succeeds, the database is again consistent. So regardless of the order in which you run, first you run A, then B, then C, or then B, C, A, it doesn't matter. Each transaction starts from a consistent database, takes it to a consistent database. So the next one, of course, sees a consistent database, so it will also leave it in a consistent state. So if individually transactions guarantee consistency, regardless of the order in which you run them, overall, you will have a consistent database. So this is an important property. And the last property, we have seen atomicity, durability, then we have seen consistency, now we will come to isolation. And in fact, we are going to spend a lot of time on concurrent access. Um, so take a simple example. This transaction is, is the same one, it is transferring money. Let us say there is another transaction which reads A and B and then prints the total. In this case, it is just A and B. Maybe it, it looks at all the accounts and loans of the bank and adds up all the things and prints that, adds or subtracts as appropriate and prints the value which should be the cash on hand. Now, what is going to happen here? You have removed from A, you have not yet added to B. So this guy is seeing an inconsistent state of the database. Okay? So isolation is the idea that a transaction should not see an inconsistent state due to other transactions. It should either look as if the other transaction never has not yet started or that it has finished. So this transaction T2 cannot see an intermediate state of T1. Either it should see the state before T1 executes or it can see the state after T2 executes. Either is fine, but it cannot see this intermediate state. Now, isolation can be ensured very easily by just running transactions one after the other. First run T1, then run T2 after T1 finishes. This is probably acceptable for a small branch. The transaction takes a fraction of a second. So even if you have 10 counters, if it takes uh, one second for a transaction and there are 10 counters, you run them one after another, it is still acceptable. However, when you have a large centralized system with multiple things coming in, this will waste resources tremendously and we will see this later. The asset properties are basically these things which we saw, atomicity, consistency, isolation and durability and these are formally defined here. Atomicity, either all operations are reflected in the database or none are. Consistency is execution of a transaction in isolation. At this point, we do not worry about other transactions coming in and messing around. If you execute it with nothing else happening, then it preserves consistency. Isolation, this is actually a little hard to define. Um, there are different notions of what is reasonable isolation. Um, so this is one kind of notion. Although multiple transactions may execute concurrently, each transaction must be unaware of other concurrently executing transactions. They should not be aware that something else is running 
and therefore intermediate transaction states must be hidden from other concurrently executing transactions or equivalently for every pair of transactions T i T j it appears to T i that either T j finished execution before T i started or T j started execution after T i finished. So, T i cannot see an intermediate state of any transaction T j and durability after a transaction completes successfully the changes it has made persist even if there are system failures. Now, of course, this depends on what is a failure uh, an example uh, which uh, is there in the book is what if a black hole swallows the earth ok all data is lost we are all lost ok and of course, the update of the transaction is also lost. So, there are limits to what you can do for durability of course, you could maybe replicate it on another star or something completely infeasible, but it is just stretching the example to a silly point to a silly level where obviously, you cannot guarantee durability. However, you should not lose data on a small common error common errors are disk failures a common error another common error is a network failure we keep having that every 5 minutes here ok you cannot afford to lose data on these standard errors another common error is a fire in a room it happens not that common but it happens you cannot afford to lose data even if there is a fire. So, we will see what you can do to replicate data remotely so that you can guarantee durability even if this place burns up it is still there, but if both are blown up well tough luck ok. So, we will stop here.